The final item of business today is the Member's Business Debate on Motion Number 10744 in the name of Myrtle Fraser on objections to Tala Avaha Wind Farm and NPF3. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Myrtle Fraser to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking colleagues from across the Chamber who signed my motion and allowed this debate to take place? And can I also welcome to the gallery uh, those who have come along to watch the debate, among them uh, members of the John Muir Trust and people from the local community in Rannoch. Uh, the Trust, the uh, Rambler Scotland and the Mountaineering Council of Scotland have all been vocal in support of this motion, as has been the local campaign group Keep Rannoch Wild. Now, I appreciate it's unusual to have a parliamentary debate on a live planning application. And I also appreciate that in responding to the debate, the member's remarks on this subject will be somewhat limited uh, and that he will not be able to say anything that will prejudice the outcome of the planning ap application. However, there are important issues which are raised by this particular application, which I wanted the opportunity to highlight and to allow Parliament to discuss uh, these uh, issues. In my view, and that of many other interested parties, the TALA application represents a test case to determine whether the Scottish Government is actually serious about protecting our wild land. The proposal is for 24 turbines of 125 metres in the moorland area between Loch Rannach and Loch Erecht. Crucially, the turbines which are proposed for this site would be erected in an area identified by Scottish natural heritage on their map as wild land. Now, anyone who has visited the location would understand why this is. Uh, Rannoch Moor is at the very heart of wild Scotland, and there are views from over 30 Munros and Corbett's which would be irreversibly affected if the application got the green light. And I use the word irreversibly uh, advisedly, because although the turbines might themselves be temporary, the infrastructure that goes with them, the tracks, uh, and I un understand in this case there would be some 12.8 kilometres of access tracks, would be visible uh, for a lifetime, if not longer. A few weeks ago, I climbed some of the hills to the north of Ben Alder. This area is as close as we get in the central highlands to a true wilderness, and it would be a tragedy to see it despoiled with an industrial development. Today's debate is not only important for the communities in the area around the proposed Tala wind farm, but for the 41 other areas across Scotland that are identified as wild land by Scottish natural heritage. Their unspoilt status is also now in question. And I use the term our wild land deliberately. Scotland's wild places are a gift to everyone in this country and should not be sacrificed for the sake of some additional megawatts of renewable energy, particularly when existing and consented renewable energy projects are very close to reaching the 2020 electricity generation target. The TALA application is attracting a huge amount of interest, both locally and nationally. The Scottish Government has received nearly 1,000 statements in opposition to the development, in contrast to just 23 in support. And these statements have come from all parts of the country and indeed internationally. But locally, there is also opposition to the application. A recent survey undertaken by the Rannoch and Tunnel Community Council showed that three quarters of local residents are in opposition to these proposals. Many of those in opposition have livelihoods that are dependent on tourist revenue earned thanks to the natural beauty of the area. For example, there are over 30,000 people a year climbing the popular Shahalian mountain, and walking tourism is a major contributor to the local economy. Diana Gabaldon, who is the author of the Outlander book series, now, of course, uh, uh, part of a TV series being filmed in Scotland, has also voiced her opposition. She has said that you cannot put a price on our landscape, and if approved, this development would be both a tragedy and a disaster for wild Scotland. In their submission uh, to the application from Scottish Natural Heritage, SNH highlight the significant damage this development would have on the Rannoch Moor peatlands and blanket bog features which have been identified as nationally important under Scottish planning policy. SNH have also given a damning verdict on the diligence of the environmental statement that uh, attaches itself to the application. And SNH believe that if approved, 
the peatlands and blanket bog resource would be permanently lost. And this is important because peatlands are carbon sinks, and destroying them to build wind farms is an illogical move which could result in higher rather than lower carbon emissions. But I'd like to concentrate, Deputy Presiding Officer, for the remainder of my remarks on the question of SNH's wild land map and what that means. Just over two months ago, the Scottish Government released its third national planning framework, which included a commitment to protect 19% of our landscape from onshore wind turbines. When announcing NPF3, the Planning Minister, Mr Mackay, assured the Scottish public that, uh, and I quote, we have taken steps to ensure that no wind farm developments can go ahead in our cherished national parks and national scenic areas, and we have strengthened the protection of wild land. Of course, the Tala application will be located just two kilometres north of the Loch Rannick and Glen Lyon National Scenic Area. At the time, I cautioned that these guidelines did not go far enough, as developments would still be possible on wild land. This was confirmed by comments from the Environment Minister, Paul Wheelhouse, in 2013, who said that, and again I quote, wild lands, sorry, wind farms could be built on wild land, but only if substantial mitigation were put in place. Now, many will have seen the recently published map from the John Muir Trust, highlighting the visual encroachment of wind farms across most of southern and eastern Scotland, and indeed increasingly in the Highlands. If approved, the uh, Tala wind farm would substantially uh, add to the parts of Scotland from which wind turbines would be visible. And one of the truly, last, truly, wild, uh, last truly wild places in Scotland would join the long list of casualties uh, which have fallen to the impact of wind turbines. I would like to hear from the Minister today in responding to this debate that this is a site unsuitable for a development of this nature. But I appreciate he is prohibited from making that particular statement. But instead it would be helpful if he could clarify the precise status of the SNH wildland map and in what circumstances renewable energy projects will be permitted on the wildlands identified. The Scottish Government talked tough on protecting wildland and this application represents their chance to prove it. We've heard a lot from the SNP over the past week about honouring vows and promises, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's now their time to honour their commitment to protecting Scotland's precious wild land. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Michael McMahon to be followed by Rob Gibson. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'd like to congratulate Murder Fraser for securing this evening's debate, because although I'm not a local member for the area affected by this particular wind farm proposal, it gives me an opportunity to revisit an issue I raised in March of this year in relation to the failure of NPF3 to set out how much we can protect our wild lands. In that debate in March, I noted that NPF3, the main issues report of April 2013, stated that in addition to our nationally important, most scenic landscapes, we also want to continue our strong protection for our wildest landscapes. Yet for all of those welcome words, there was a removal of the core area of wild land map from NPF3. That would be a very grave omission in my view and is one of the main reasons why the debate that Mr Fraser has brought before Parliament this evening has to happen. If we do not recognise the need to protect our nationally important and scenic landscapes, then those areas of Scotland will continue to fall victim to the onward march of the renewables industry at the expense of our natural environment. Now let me make it clear, I am not opposed to wind farms in principle. I fully accept that wind farms have a part to play in our future energy production capacity, but I am far from convinced that the right balance is being struck between their development and protection of our wild lands. As I said in March, I cannot agree with Scottish Renewables that NPF3 presents significant risk and would create a barrier to the economic and environmental benefits that renewables could bring to Scotland. The reality is that it is not the renewables industry that is at risk, but our natural landscapes if we fail to ensure their protection. If we do not cite wind farms appropriately, we will continue to lose more of Scotland's greatest natural assets. If the plan for the proposed Tala wind farm is approved, it will undoubtedly transform Rannoch for the worse. 
It will, as Murdoch Fraser said, adversely affect views from more than 30 Munroes and Corbett's, with the wind turbines being visible from the West Highland Railway Line and the A82, which, as everyone knows, is the main tourist route through the West Highlands. Now, if a developer was to suggest building a multi-storey building taller than Glasgow's Red Road flats on Rannoch Moor, they would get laughed out of any planning committee. And yet here we have a proposal to put turbines taller than those flats on just that natural landscape because we have no proper control over the siting of wind farms in Scotland. The threat that this would pose not only to this particular Highland Vista is concerning enough in itself, but the harm that will be done to rare bird species is equally worrying. The proposed development is also located almost entirely within an area of deep peat and priority peatland. This habitat is identified by the Scottish Planning Policy 2014 as being nationally important and worthy of significant protection. So Rannoch's reputation as natural beauty is the main drive for tourism to the area, and it's hard to see how that reputation will not be damaged. It's one of Scotland's last great wild land areas, and the need to protect it is a major test for Scotland's planning framework. If it cannot be protected by using NPF3, then what other wildland area can be protected and what one will be next on the agenda of our renewables companies? Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Rob Gibson to be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate, although I did not sign the motion because I can't agree with the motion that was put forward. I think we should look a little bit at the history of the Loch Rannach area. And if we think about it over a period of 300 years, we're talking about what was a cattle herding and small tenant area, which was swept away by the 1745 uprising. Fortunately, the forfeited estates commission managed to save part of the black wood of Rannoch on the south side of the loch. And as the forestry commission says, it's one of the largest areas of ancient pine forest, which once stretched across Britain and Europe, and indeed, which we would hope to expand again. And a correspondent with Alexander Mackenzie, who compiled his uh, history of the Highland Clearances, uh, informed uh, Mackenzie that in the 1830s, that there was a large amount of clearance taking place along the north side of Loch Rannoch, and he details the places, some of which are in the estate of Talavi. So if you recognize that these people were removed and that indeed there were still some families there, you have to then come forward to the discussion about the crofting bill in 1885. And the members for Perthshire, for Banffshire, for Butte and for Aberdeenshire kept their areas out of the crofting uh, law. The crofting law ensured that there would be communities there and indeed in most crofting areas there still are communities. What a pity that Rannoch side wasn't one of them. And today's landlords know that shooting and fishing alone won't pay their running costs. Hence, they look for other forms of use of their natural resources, such as wind applications. And that, that uh, is also set in the context of a renewed concern for land reform. And indeed, the land reform, which I hope will see taxes on landowners of such large properties, including Tal Aviv. Uh, and it's one such example which, if they have some income, could be directed in the form of taxes, which they probably don't pay at the moment, uh, and perhaps pay in another country. Now, forestry and hydro schemes gave employment after World War II, but the local population kept dwindling. And today, just over 30 pupils are to be found in the local primary school and nursery. Presiding officer, it's very likely that 99% of these young people will leave their home area for education and careers and never return under the current system of the economy. Should local people not benefit from the development of natural resources such as wind power, I would ask, should they not have the benefit of a cash source that is constant and isn't relying on the potential cuts in local government funding, the potential cuts in national government funding, 
which are threatened by the Tory Lib Dem austerity programme that's set to bite even deeper, deeper now in the next few years. No, I don't want to take any interventions. What we have is a fragile community that should benefit under Scottish Government spatial planning uh, guidelines. To be a low carbon place, yes. To be a natural place to invest. A successful and sustainable place and a connected place. And that's how the Planning Minister and the Environment Minister saw the issue. They told the Raki Committee at the time of the NPF3, in their view, the identification of land as a core area of wildland does not mean that there is a ban on development taking place. Development can still take place as long as it can be done in a way that is fully mitigated and the environment can be protected. But the clinching factor, presiding officer, is the inexorable pressures of climate change. The clearances removed the small farming economy. The lure of the city robs small places of their most basic services. Now climate change, if unmitigated, could destroy the very scenery that some people talk about. I've climbed Shehalyan, Ben Alder, uh, Mulavuri and many other of these hills. The distance between many of these things and any proposal for such a wind farm are things that we have to take into account. And I therefore think it's a pity to pity the plumage and forget the dying bird. As far as I'm concerned, presiding officer, I think that the socio-economic issues that take into account the potential for a small community expanding, not dwindling, is something which has to be looked at very seriously. Thank you. And to now call Neil Finlay. Thanks, presiding officer. This uh, proposed wind farm is not in my region. It will not particularly affect my constituents on a daily basis, but the consequences of its approval, uh, if that indeed that happens, will be felt far and wide. If it proceeds, it will be viewed as, the, as having met the conditions for the new planning framework and Scottish planning policy, which stipulate that any significant effects on the qualities of these areas must be substantially overcome by siting, design or other mitigation. How on the earth can you design out the impact of 100 metre plus high turbines against the background of one of Scotland's most rugged and wild landscape? That is a very basic question we have to ask. Now, I wanted to speak, take the opportunity to speak in this debate to highlight the concerns of my constituents about their landscape also, a very different landscape from that around Loch Rannoch. Uh, for the people of villages like West Calder, Kirk Newton, Adiwell, Longridge, Falthouse, their landscape is just as cherished. It is a an insult, whether that comes from planners or whoever, to infer that their natural heritage is any less value than any other natural heritage. And it seems appropriate at this point, I think, to refer to a letter that I've kept for around 15 years. It's the evidence presented by Mrs Mary Allison of Blackridge and West Lowland to a planning inquiry into an open cast coal application uh, affecting the village that she grew up in. And Mary's contribution, I think, is as relevant today in relation to wind farm development as it was then in relation to open ca cast development. I'd like you to listen to what she said. She said of the, in inverted commas, experts paid to provide evidence to any inquiry. Many of the presentations heard prior to mine have the lure of scientific objectivity. However, however I would contend that these presentations do not give us answers they provide a collection of research facts which are neither wrong nor right. They are simply facts that have no meaning until we bring our values and our judgments to their interpretation. The developer, and we can see the wind farm developer in this, uh, this scenario, has a set of corporate values, the government a set of political values, the community a set of community values. None of these are value-free, neutral or objective. We see each in a different light because we each stand to gain or lose different things from the proposal. I would contend that the community can only use, uh, lose. Any economic gain will be short-term, whilst the longer-term consequences will be negative. Speaking of her community, Mary, a senior research fellow, said, these landscapes and the experiences are what give me my sense of place in the world, where I come from, the communities that made me these are valuable to me and could never be recreated. That is the same irrespective of where you live and beauty and the value we place in our communities in the eye of the beholder. I love 
for example, the five sisters shale bings in West Lothian, just as much as I love the landscape that's being discussed here. Uh, we may be here to debate the construction on, of a, a wind farm in Rannoch Moor, but as of today, in my area, 12 wind farms housing 83 turbines have been given approval to go ahead and are operational in West Lothian. The problems with the Scottish Government's wind farm policy, and I fear this may happen in this wind farm as well, is the problem of over-concentration, because when one application succeeds, then the developers pile in with a whole lot of more applications, and communities feel under siege. It is a free-for-all, and I fear it will get worse under the new planning policy. And th this is not to dismiss the, 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 the necessary move towards uh, renewable energy. It is vital that Scotland plays its part in reducing carbon emissions. However, one of the main issues with all of this is on ownership. This application is by Aventus BV, a Dutch company, probably a Dutch multinational. The applications in my area come from Spanish, French, Italian, Danish multinationals. A recent one came from an Austrian prince. None of them are owned by the community. None of them are owned by local government. None of them are owned by the public sector. Therefore, the money flutters off to the boardrooms of Madrid, of Paris, of Rome, or of Copenhagen or wherever. And I believe what we need is a national spatial plan that avoids the over-concentration and the ruination of natural landscapes like this, whilst ensuring that where we have wind farm development, that communities are rewarded for wind technology being applied in their area. We need a plan that takes into account everybody's views in Scotland, each voice given an equal footing, each community's view respected. The Scottish Government must be careful because its imbalanced, imbalanced and mismanaged pursuit of renewable energy targets is turning people against renewable energy, and that is a very dangerous thing. But all I would say is that some of the applications in my area uh, are as likely to turn people against wind farm development as this application is in this area. Thank you. I now call on Derek Mackay. Minister, uh, you have around seven minutes to respond to the debate, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as has been mentioned, the ministerial code is clear that I must take particular care to avoid conflicts of interest when dealing with planning matters, including the granting of energy consents. This is the second time in recent months that a member's business debate has come forward which focused on a live planning application. It is well known that ministers cannot comment publicly on live planning applications as this could potentially prejudice the final decision. Given this, I have concerns that such uh, debates have been conducted. I should also make it clear that the Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism, who cannot attend today, takes decisions on Section 36 applications. And rightly, as the Code states, I cannot express an opinion publicly on a particular case which is before Ministers for decision. Following the debate this evening, Presiding Officer, I will be seeking to write to the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee to seek their views on whether the guidance on motion and amendments can be reviewed in light of the Parliament accepting motions for debate on live planning applications. Moving on, any current planning decisions should not be considered as setting a precedent. Future proposed developments will be assessed on their own merits, given the unique circumstances of each case and always in the context of relevant policy and guidance, of course. Neil Finlay. So all this talk about an open parliament discussing and debating the issues of the day, we're now going to get a political fix that avoids people discussing the very issues that all these people in the gallery want to discuss. Minister. Well, I think that's quite an unfortunate intervention when what I'm trying to do is to uphold the integrity of the planning system and that should work in a way that inspires confidence in the system. If we indulge in quasi-judicial matters in the chamber, then that risks even the rights of objectors within the planning system as well. Myrtle Fraser, to his credit, has raised issues of concern in due parliamentary process in terms of the committees and studying National Planning Framework 3 and Scottish planning policy. Mr Finlay has not taken the same approach in terms of supporting the changes to SPP and MPF3. 
So I suggest if you object to Scottish planning policies, you do it on the basis of policy objections in the right place, as opposed uh, to trying to use mechanisms which may be counterproductive to those who you seek to represent. In terms of the statement, I think I need to make progress on the issues that have been raised. If you want to come in later once I've made uh, further progress, I'm happy to, to take you then. So let me emphasise the clear position I set out when I published National Planning Framework 3 and Scottish Planning Policy this June. On all matters, I appeared before the Parliament and offered to return to the Committees of Parliament on any matter of policy. MPF 3 is quite clear, and I quote, National scenic areas and national parks attract many visitors and reinforce our international image. We also want to continue our strong protection for our wildest landscapes. Wild land is a nationally important asset. The pressing challenge of climate change means that our action on the environment must continue to evolve, strengthening our longer-term resilience. A planned approach to development helps to strike the right balance between safeguarding assets which are irreplaceable and facilitating change in a sustainable way. We must work with, not against, our environment to maintain and further strengthen its contribution to society." End of quote. In setting that out in MPF3, supporting delivery of a low-carbon place, the new Scottish planning policy provides clear guidance and clear guide to preparing spatial frameworks for onshore wind energy development. Parliament did not comment on the detail within this policy, but did call for greater clarity in SPP. So let me be clear again. The Scottish Government has stated that wind farms will not be acceptable in national parks and in national scenic areas. That is our policy. I also set out in SPP that I expect significant protection to be given to national and international designations such as Nature 2000 sites, other nationally important mapped environmental interests such as wild land and an area around settlements where visual impacts need to be considered. That is our policy. Proposals outside of NSAs it still have to be assessed for their impacts on landscape, including effects on wild land. Not only do those new policies provide certainty about our natural heritage interests and parity for our communities, but they set out a very clear approach to planning for onshore wind that I expect to see in development plans across the country, an approach which is appropriate to the scale of development. Of course. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way and, and, and setting out on the record what, what he's just done. I wonder if he could specifically address the, the, the point I made towards the end of my speech and tell us, you know, in what circumstances would you see renewable energy projects being permitted on areas which are designated as wild land? Minister. I do believe, and I'm being very careful to avoid reference to any live application, but I believe the detail is set out in NPF 3 and SPP, where all those considerations have to be taken into account uh, and a judgment uh, made. But I would reinforce the point again that one decision is not a precedent for another. Every case must be judged on its merits with all the relevant material considerations to hand. So it would be wrong for me to pick a live application or a hypothetical situation to make the policy point when I believe that the policy guidance is much stronger than was there before, and I have a number of organisations, including the John Muir Trust, that agree with that point, that the guidance there is much stronger and much more supportive of the environment than was the case uh, before. It is the responsibility, on a related point, of planning authorities to prepare spatial frameworks. Since the publication of SPP, many frameworks are now in preparation and my officials are working closely with planning authorities as these come through our development plan gateway and as proposed plans heads towards examination. We are working closely with our environment agencies, industry representative bodies and planning practitioners and all others across Scotland either face to face in gatherings at events or by conducting research on the impact of onshore wind. We will continue to draw on the verifiable evidence to implement those policies in such a way as to ensure that we steer development to the right places so that the benefits are not outweighed by the negative impacts. In relation to climate change and decarbonising our electricity production, 
The Scottish Government has made its energy policy a top priority and has achieved great progress, despite being limited in terms of the responsibilities. The industry has expanded rapidly over the past decade, bringing millions of pounds of investment to local areas throughout Scotland, empowering often remote rural communities to the tune of some £13.5 billion since 2010. The renewable sector now supports at least 11,695 jobs in Scotland, around 3,000 of them in skilled engineering jobs alone. Some companies report rising tender activity over the last three months, showing scope to return to the same workload level of 2013. Reducing energy demand by 12% by 2020 and focusing on energy efficiency are important elements of our efforts to reduce CO2 emissions. And we want to meet at least 30% of overall energy demand from renewables by 2020. I hope members will share with me the importance for direction of travel in relation to renewables to strike the right balance. Climate change is a huge challenge, and we saw in demonstrations across the globe just last week. Climate change mitigation is a European obligation, and domestically our climate change legislation needs to secure decarbonisation of the energy sector, underpinned by efforts to meet a range of targets that I have just mentioned. By no means do I infer that all onshore wind proposals will gain planning permission of the 310 wind turbine-related planning appeals since May 2007, 194, that's 62 per cent, were refused and 116, 38 per cent, were allowed. So ministers refuse or modify inappropriately scaled wind farms routinely and of course ministers will consent appropriately scaled and located wind farms too. To demonstrate our balanced approach, Parliament lead look no further than the policies I supported when I published MPF3 and SPP. They are designed to secure the right development in the right places and to protect our natural and built heritage and communities in equal measure. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes Murdo Fraser's debate. But before I close this meeting of Parliament, could I just say that um, I do note the Minister's intention to write to the public, uh, public, uh, sorry, the, the Standards, Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee about the issues, and that is a matter for the Scottish Government. However, with regard to the debate this evening, um, parliamentary business, including members' business, was agreed by the Parliamentary Bureau and by the Parliament. Thank you. I now close this meeting of Parliament.